You're recording. This is a presentation that I gave in um, April of 2008 to the American Society of Marine Artists. Um, the American Society of Marine Artists has been around for about 60 years. It's uh, composed, it was founded by a number of some of the best marine artists in the country. Um, a lot of the painters that, that founded the organization went on to become uh, major contributors to museum collections around the world. And these are some, exa some examples. Uh, John Stobart and Carl Evers, uh, to just name a couple of those fantastically talented people. The oldest member of our society is Lester J. Stone, who is going to be 97, or is 97. Um, Lester was born in the state of Washington. Um, these are his parents, uh, Walter and Lottie Stone. Um, when Lester was growing up, when he was seven years old, his mother got tuberculosis. and um, she couldn't take care of him anymore. So Lester went into a, an orphanage in uh, Tucson, Arizona. And he remained in that orphanage for seven years while his mother tried to recuperate. She did eventually get better. Lester went back to um, live with his family. By then he was in high school. And at a very, at that early age, he was being noticed. Um, he had a passion for ships, and he had artistic skills. Um, this is a, a newspaper article about a, a boat that he built mm. in the 1920s. Um, and this uh, interest in, in uh, naval activities um, led him in his uh, third year of high school into uh, the US, uh, U.S. Naval Prep School. He went to high school there for two years, and when he got out of high school, he went into the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis and um, completed his uh, courses in 1934. In 1936, he met Peggy King, and um, they were married. Uh, so here's the young cadet, Lester, and his new, his new bride, Peggy. He went, to, went on to naval flight training in Pensacola, Florida. This is a Boeing uh, naval uh, fighter from the 1930s. Lester trained on aircraft, uh, on this one, an aircraft similar to this. Um, when he got out of flight school, he was assigned to the USS Lexington, um, an aircraft carrier, where he became part of the bomber squadron in 1937. And uh, 1938, he went into a torpedo squadron. He flew all kinds of airplanes. Um, these, this is an amphibian, uh, Grumman Duck. Um, and he was, he was checked out in, in um, a number of, of, of different types of naval aircraft. Again, this is the same vessel. It was, uh, could land on the water or land on a runway. He was injured in an air crash when he flipped an airplane on landing in 1940. And um, his injuries put him in the hospital. And um, he, he recuperated from the accident. And then once he was released from the hospital, he was deployed um, to the utility squadron, utility squadron one in Hawaii. And um, that was in 1940. And one of the tasks of the, of the squadron was to tow targets. And I think when you see what's going on in this slide, you can get an idea of how dangerous this was. Um, these airplanes pulled targets behind them, and then ships fired at the targets with live ammunition. <coughs> this is another one of the airplanes from that squadron. Now, you'll notice that this slide says Utility Squadron 1, Ford Island. Well, it's 1940, Ford Island, and Ford Island is right in the middle of Pearl Harbor. The entire U.S. fleet was at, um, at Pearl Harbor at that time, and there was another fleet that was assembling that was also interested in Pearl Harbor, but this was not an American fleet. 
These are photographs of Japanese torpedo bombers taking off to attack Pearl Harbor in December of 1941. This is what Pearl Harbor look, looks like today. But even today you can see um, um, the um, Ford Island is right in the center of the harbor. And if you look carefully at, um, at Ford Island, you can see that there's still... Um, I'm going to get up a little closer to this. You can see that um, there's still a runway here. Um, and this, along both sides of Ford Island, uh, there were, in, in, 19, in the 1941, um, battleships were lined up in here, and other vessels were, were scattered around the area. At that time, um, Lester was living over here. Um, the next slide is a diagram of the same harbor. You can see that little peninsula where um, Lester was living. When the Japanese attack came, um, the Japanese airplanes circled around the harbor and approached on their first torpedo runs right over this peninsula. Now, Lester had been notified, they had been getting radio messages that they thought that Pearl Harbor was going to be attacked by the Japanese. They were getting ready for it. I mean, they didn't, they didn't know exactly when it was going to come, but they thought that it could happen at, at any time. And so that Sunday morning when the attack began, uh, Lester heard the first few bombs going off and heard the aircraft and walked out of his house to look up and watch um, a Japanese torpedo uh, bomber fly 50 feet over his roof, um, lower, fly lower over the harbor and launch a torpedo against uh, one of the vessels on this side of the island. And immediately he knew the attack was underway. So he woke other people up in the building. He grabbed a naval photographer and he said, uh, we have to get over to Ford Island and do whatever we can do over there to uh, fend off the attack. This is a photograph that was taken by a Japanese attacking aircraft. Um, this is uh, Battleship Row. Starting on the left-hand side of the picture, you can see um, in the lower right, in the lower left corner, um, that is the uh, USS Nevada. Behind that is the Arizona. And directly behind that, the third vessel back, is the West Virginia. Now if you look carefully at the West Virginia, you can see torpedo tracks in the water. And you can see the concussion going off of the first torpedo hitting the, hitting the uh, West Virginia. This is from a slightly different angle, but you can see that the torpedo has hit the West Virginia and exploded. You can also see the Oklahoma has been hit. That's the ship directly to the right of the, the West Virginia. This is one of the most famous photographs taken of Pearl Harbor, the Pearl Harbor attack. The photographer that Lester had awakened and threw into his car to drive over to Ford, I Ford Island uh, took this photograph standing next to Lester. Lester watched this happen. Um, this is the USS Shaw, a, U a United States destroyer, um, exploding from a direct hit on its magazine. It was in dry dock on the other side of Pearl Harbor. This explosion that you see is the Arizona being hit. Now, when the Arizona exploded, when this exact instant in time took place, Lester was right here, right next to it. Um, they had driven around the harbor, they had crossed the causeway, gone on to Ford Island, and they went directly for the airplanes. Uh, Lester thought that at first that maybe they'd be able to get some of the planes in the air to attack the Japanese, but the runway was so badly damaged they couldn't get any of the planes off the ground. So he figured at least we could get into the airplanes. The airplanes were, uh, the, the rear cockpits of these airplanes had machine guns. And he figured if we could start to operate these guns, we could at least fight, fight back. So just before the Arizona exploded, 
he, he was in command of a small group of guys. And he had them get into these airplanes and start shooting at the, at the attacking Japanese aircraft. The Arizona exploded. And he looked up into the debris that was sent flying hundreds of feet into the air. And he said he could see something twisting in the air and coming down toward where he was. And landing between the airplanes where Lester was standing was a chunk of steel the size of this room. And it stuck straight in the ground between the two airplanes. And behind it, he could see this tiny little burning object. And the burning object came down and landed right at his feet. It was the uh, damage control manual from the Arizona on fire at his feet. He put the fire out and stuck the pamphlet in his jacket. Um, and later, later on in his life, he donated the, the pamphlet back to the Navy. And it, it's part of the USS Arizona uh, Museum. Um, this is the scene on Ford Island as it's being attacked. This is what Lester was witnessing. And this is the aftermath. This is the Arizona a couple of days later. The American fleet was uh, badly damaged. Uh, the aircraft carriers, the American aircraft carriers were not in Pearl Harbor that day, but the war had begun. The Navy uh, had a deficit to make up, um, and Lester had to play a role in it. Um, here, is, here he is being decorated after that action. Uh, the war was on, um, and they knew that Lester had, had special skills. And so instead of going directly into action after Pearl, he was sent back to um, Pennsylvania to Philadelphia, and then later to Lakehurst, New Jersey, to take part in a top secret project, the Pelican Project. It began in 1942. Um, as, as far as I could determine, this is the, this was the, um, this is, it, it was amazing that Lester took part in this. Um, these were the first tests of a true guided missile. The, the Navy had been working on an idea for a self-propelled guided missile. And um, they decided that Lester would be the pilot that would launch these, these um, missiles. Now, the guided missile never became an effective weapon. Or was, it, ne it was never used in World War II. Um, it was used later on. But this is, this is the first example of a, of a guided missile. Um, after the tests of the missile, Lester was promoted and uh, went back to the Pacific Theater as a planner of naval actions. And Lester helped plan the Battle of Guam, the Philippines, and Okinawa. So he was right in the thick of it. A few days after Hiroshima was bombed, Lester was there. He, he walked the streets of Hiroshima. He saw the damage of that was done to the city um, after the atomic bomb uh, was detonated there. This is a photograph of Lester when he received his uh, promotion to captain. This was uh, at, at the end of the war. Lester went on to become uh, the executive officer on the aircraft carrier USS Sicily. He did three tours of duty in Korea. This is a list of the medals and badges and commendations and citations that Lester received in his military career. It's a long and distinguished list, an amazing accomplishment for one person. The most unusual of all those decorations was the Order of the Secret Treasure awarded to Lester by the Emperor of Japan. Now this was in the, in the mid-50s. Um, I found this to be remarkable that he, he not only earned these, these uh, medals in battle, but after the war was over, Lester was honored by the Emperor of Japan for doing what? 
for going to Japan to train Japanese pilots how to fly military aircraft. I thought that was such an incredible irony. He had a number of assignments um, after the war. Um, he became uh, the commanding officer at the Naval Air Station where the Blue Angels were, were um, also stationed. Um, he finished out his military career um, in the late 50s. And um, then he pursued a very different life. Um, Lester became more and more involved with painting. And um, this, is the, this is the Lester that I have come to know. He did beautiful watercolors and oils. Um, he painted all across the United States and overseas. Um, he painted a variety of subjects. Um, Lester was interested in all kinds of art. It had a very, very wide range of interests, as you can see. I think this is one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> but great watercolors. The, and the paintings that I know the best are the marine paintings that, that Lester has done. This is a beautiful schooner piece that Marge has at her home. another piece that Marge has. And a very famous portrait of uh, General Eisenhower. Lester's had many commissions. He's taught classes and produced um, thousands of wonderful works of art. This is a beautiful little study of Lester's wife, Peggy. Um, it's one of my favorite one of my favorites of his uh, portraits of his, of his family, although this one is also very nice. This is Marge when she was younger. This is Marge's son. He, he's, Lester was very good at portraits. This is a woman um, in Spain. Another character that he was interested and fascinated by. Beautiful, beautiful study. But the thing I think that was most imp always most important to Lester was his family, his four children, uh, Judy, Susie, Lester Jr., and Marge, and his grandchildren. He took great, a great deal of pride in his family, and um, especially his wife, Peggy. And that's the Lester that we know, Lester Stone. And we wished him well and congratulated him on uh, a life well lived. That's the program.